Leo's son, Dr. Lenny Kai, who today is a federal district conservationist in Colorado, told me tales of a naive Leo riding a train to Oregon, flicking cigarettes out the window and starting a series of forces. <laughs>
and in fall of 1946, when markets returned to the gridiron under its new coach, a brilliant but rather disagreeable man named Trevor Reese. Reese was building a team around returning veterans, men who were older than most modern NFL rookies. And the Cock Boys became the centerpiece of that first Golden Flash squad. This was the first brother combination at Kent State in decades. And the record courier built a human interest story around this. And there's a copy of that story on the back table. We'll look at it during the intermission. Now, Tom was the star of the spring practices. And he was installed in left halfback. Leo, larger and slower, was third in the depth chart at right half. Now, both the Cock Boys scored a touchdown in the 40 to nothing victory over Hiram College to open the season. Tom wrenched his knee in that game, an injury that would hamper him for the rest of the season. In the second game against John Carroll, Leo against, <coughs> excuse me, in the second game against John Carroll, Leo again scored a touchdown in a 20-7 win. And then in the fourth game against Baldwin Wallace, Leo broke his leg. And Trevor Reese had no use for laying players. He told Leo that he was no longer on the team. A bitter lesson that Leo would remember for the rest of his life when he had to handle boys who had sacrificed their bodies for the women bondage. But Leo was a fighter. Someone who had been nearly blown out of B-24 was not intimidated by a petty tyrant like Trevor Reese. He gamely rehabilitated his leg for the next six months, showed up in spring practice, and re-earned his spot in the Kent State backfield. The opening lineup for the 1947 Golden Flashes had both cots in the backfield, and both of them passed for touchdowns in the victory over Mount Union College. Tom rushed for 40 yards and passed for 89, and Leo rushed for 24 and added a 10-yard touchdown pass. It was the last time that they would ever appear in a game together. Reese had recruited many new players, including several who had graduated after the war and were younger and faster than the damage Leo caught, and his playing time again began to dwindle. He made appearances in games against Miami University and Kalamazoo College, and then his name once more disappeared from the Kent State roster. He didn't even get a letter that year. Leo, now 24 years old, would never wear a football uniform again. He had married Mary Keel in June of 1947, and they settled into a barracks-type rooming house on North River Street in Kent behind Bissler's funeral home. He hid the books, came home to Mary at night, and looked forward to graduating in 1949 with a Bachelor of Science in Education. Leo wanted to be a teacher, but even more than that, he wanted to be a coach. And in the summer of 1949, as Leo and Mary welcomed their first child, Alan, into the world, and Leo needed a job, Wyndham High School, in a small town governed by Mayor Jim Purdy, needed someone to shape up their stats act football team. And that would be the only Leo didn't inherit much from Warden McDonald. The Bombers didn't know how to win, despite having several talented players. He brought in the T formation with him from Kent State and began teaching football from the ground up. The Portage County Conference had fractured into an 18 league, now called the Portage County League, with Aurora, Freedom, Manaway, and Hiram, leaving to form a weak loop that they called <laughs> Leo's first game against Atwater, a 19 to nothing loss, didn't even get a game article in the newspaper. Because much of the paper that day was dominated by news that Russia had exploded its first atomic bomb. That was the day the Cold War began. That began a string of humiliating defeats by Ravenna Township, Randolph, and Rosetown. What score and Wyndham did manage in those lopsided games was done by Dick Campbell and Don Clark. The record courier called the Bombers improving, a word newspapers always use for teams that usually lose by 30 points or more. 